regards, I'm the opposite to Ian. I'm a Londoner um, who was born in Australia. So I've left Sydney rather than a Londoner come to Sydney. Um, and I must say that uh, often when I get into cabs in London, they hear my accent, they ask me why the hell did I leave Sydney for London? And I must admit, last night in the opening cocktail party, um, uh, with the fabulous view over Circular Quay, I was perhaps asking myself that question. But more seriously, uh, London has a great gravity for me in terms of the amazing palimpsest of that city. And as um, uh, one of the case studies I want to show you is actually born from um, that palimpsest and the beautiful grain that is London. Now, tall buildings, as we know, are incredibly um, uh, uh, impactful, but they're also deeply normative. And there is often a collision between those who are desiring the status quo and those who would like to herald in the new typology. And that battleground is often fought uh, in to do with the immediate public realm, but also at the level of the cityscape as well. Now, that um, battleground, that collision of those two scales is very much evident of cities of a suburban and also cities of a medieval um, pattern grid, such as London and Calgary. And I wish to use 100 Bishop's Gate and also Brookfield Place Calgary as essentially the scaffold to talk about how we can insert tall buildings into such grain. And the two projects are 100 Bishop's Gate um, and Brookfield Place Calgary. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge particularly three collaborators. Um, these two projects started uh, when I was a director, board member, and um, global sector head of office buildings. Um, and uh, very much wish to thank Brookfield for releasing me to work on these in our firm, Arnie Fender Castellides, and also for Brookfield providing some of this material. Um, other collaborators, Eliza Morrison, um, who originally received the consent for 100 Bishop's Gate, um, and Dialogue, uh, Martin Sparrow, who's here in the audience, um, uh, our um, architectural partners uh, in Calgary. So, First off, 100 Bishop's Gate. Um, it's a million square feet, over 40 storeys, knitted into the fabric of London. And it's a transformational project on a number of levels um, for a transformational city. And transformational city in that we add over 100,000 people to the 8.8 .8 million people every year. It's the home, despite Brexit, uh, for banking factories and pro-business and it has an incredibly rich vibrancy on the ground level, and that great palimpsest that I mentioned earlier. And it's also a city of evolution uh, that continues to change, but there is a consistency there, some of which Ian has mentioned. So all of, those, all of us as architects who work in London understand the dominance of St. Paul's. And there's a view here of the medieval church of um, uh, Henry VIII's time, uh, with an unfamiliar spire uh, before it was rebuilt by Sir Christopher Wren. Um, and even Canaletto's idealised London after the Great Fire shows the prominence um, that has existed for many, many centuries of this fine building. And London, as um, Ian was touching on, could really be considered, in my view, as planning by omission. There are many view corridors that make up the London View Management Framework, that essentially determine where you can't build. Uh, and then beyond that is then essentially about crafting buildings that are right for its context and also uh, buildings that then enliven and activate uh, the streetscape. And in white there is a, a building of ours which has been shaped on cityscape terms uh, as much as um, uh, ground plane activation as well. And that particular building, if we use that as a counterpoint for 100 Bishop's Gate, is all about its relationship to its neighbours and how that building might be sculptured and formed to then be respectful of that and create greater open spaces at the ground plane. And then also be one that could occupy the air rights in such a way that uh, does create a tension between neighbours. Um, and doing that in a, in a way that creates a varied uh, and variegated silhouette and one that respects the street rhythm and the path, in this particular case, of 
uh, Leadenhall Street, as well its um, form being shaped by its surroundings. And um, certainly you can perhaps just see off in the background St Paul's here. All of our buildings in London are then uh, shaped not only by these uh, view management frameworks, but also by the perspectival experience down Fleet Street, as this building is. Um, 100 Bishopsgate um, is not in a dissimilar position to the building that Ian Case studied. It's right on the edge of the line of the old London Wall. And also shown in red there is the line of the processional route through Bishopsgate. So how then to create a building that um, doesn't straddle the wall but has to be respectful of it and also um, then respectful of the immediate street grain? Um, the existing footprint is made up of um, creating a um, courtyard to the rear of the building. And uh, Graham Morrison, in the initial consent, um, realised that the site could be devised as two parallelograms. And that then resolves the buildings at the top into um, a clean rectangular floor plate and is very respectful about twisting the site, of which we then worked with him to further develop that um, in terms of how that might um, comfortably negotiate the bend in London Wall. Um, and the built form does twist and shift for that alignment of um, what is now called Camomile Street and also reflects away from the ancient monument of St. Ethelburga's church. Um, and the original consent uh, envisaged something uh, in terms of the, a, a podium building of different articulation and um, we were hired uh, initially in isolation from Allies and Morrison to think about how we could increase the flexibility of that, which um, we're now being partnered with Allies and Morrison and developing. And similarly, um, the view that we see from uh, the alignment of Old London Wall, where the building twists um, for the bend in the street, and also is then offering and inviting a connection through into the courtyard uh, of that um, development. Uh, on the left, we're viewing along London Wall and um, uh, down Bishopsgate on the right. And the building has a grain that reflects um, the scale of the immediate neighbours and gets a vertical rhythm um, uh, through its articulation that is responsive both for uh, its climatic um, and solar radiance issues uh, as much as its architectural form um, and proximity to the old London wall. And the inner courtyard um, space is incredibly important. And I think if we think of the streets of London being the arteries um, of that city, these courtyards are real, and the, the laneways that link them are essentially the capillaries that um, feed London. As well as being a transformational project in terms of how it uh, takes a, a group of undistinguished 1980s buildings and repurposes them um, elegantly around the twist of the London Wall, it also is transformational in terms of um, Brookfield's edition of how value has been uh, garnered. So there's a massive increase of over 100,000 square feet of net lettable area. Uh, part of that has been achieved by the removal of uh, and rationalisation of uh, fire stairs. Part of that's also been understanding that high density steel is quite available in Europe, uh, so the 22 metre spans of the tower are quite accommodating. And the cladding zone's been reduced as well from 600 down to a uh, triple silver uh, double glazed unit that um, achieves the part L requirements of London, uh, is a great performer and still delivers floor to ceiling glazing. And um, that yielded almost 10,000 square feet and the core has substantially reduced in size. And also um, the MEP has been rationalised thinking from the inside out about how tenants want to move through the building, so that mechanical plant is positioned where we have a definite break between a podium floor and a tower floor. And squeezing the floor to floor sandwich also enabled us to uh, deliver some additional floors into the tower um, by working um, uh, those tolerances um, and avoiding increasing height to the building. So the resulting floor plate is much cleaner for the insurance land of where this is, um, right by St Mary Axe um, and Lloyds of London and also uh, big banking factories. Uh, the floor plate um, has now um, been successful in which um, several years before completion, um, it's 80% um, tenanted. 
So that's the medieval city. What about um, collisions and connections um, that occur in the suburban city? Uh, we are lucky enough to uh, be invited by Brookfield to a competition which we were successful in, um, in uh, Calgary. Um, and Calgary is an amazing city. Um, formed uh, in the late 1800s, um, there was a garden plan in the 1930s, uh, which is very much about the garden city utopian idea. And shortly after that, a photograph on the right shows great suburban morphologies of buildings not greatly knitted together. Um, it's a city that is bound by river, road and rail. And on the right, you'll see it's also blessed with great proximity to uh, the Rockies. And views matter, um, extraordinarily important in Calgary. The existing um, buildings on the site um, um, were challenging for pedestrian experiences. Uh, the second phase tower, which is 40 storeys, will replace the parkade on the left. And uh, there's an opportunity we discovered for creating great open space. Um, and there's an existing open space on the right, um, directly opposite our site. So how do we create this great activated um, uh, ground plane? Now, what we have to contend with in Calgary is also uh, the fact that it gets severely cold with temperatures below minus 30 centigrade in winter, uh, which has resulted in this enclosed pedestrian network um, that links all of these buildings downtown, or at least most of them, in a controlled environment, um, 15 feet above ground level, um, called affectionately as plus 15. However, it has an impact on the streetscape, which is one of the things that this project, in terms of urban repair, sought to identify and um, acknowledge. So without any reliable architectural context, we sought an understanding of this great landform, of this fantastic wide open plain, an amazingly silhouetted uh, mountain range, and developed buildings that would harness the effects of this great light that blesses Calgary as one of the sunnier cities within Canada. And we believe right from the outset that we could learn from nature. And we, although we recognised there were plenty of buildings that literally took the silhouette of uh, these mountains, we concluded that it was the spaces between the mountains that were richer. And in many regards, it became our calling card saying that the spaces between these buildings were just as important as the buildings themselves. And we learned from this by recognising that from that hard-edged uh, top of the mountains to the soft edge, there was a paradigm that we could shift and we could invert to create an architecture that was born out of its context. And we did that by organising the buildings that were respectful of this street grid um, in terms of being hard-edged at its base, um, aligned to that uh, city grid, but being much more soft and fluid and delicate at its top and tapering the building as those corners shift. And that taper shifts from a radius which is just below a metre uh, at its ground level um, to 4.5 metres size for uh, conference rooms and offices on the perimeter. The glass sections are conical, uh, they're double glazed units, um, with great research and design that's gone in to make sure that there's a purity of how they play uh, in the light. Uh, and that tapering of the building form helps with um, the emphasis of the height of the building. And we've also brought the glass to the top of the building to silhouette it, um, uh, referencing some of the great characteristics that you perceive within the Calgary landscape, and particularly around the Rockies. And as that glass rolls over in the double-edged corners uh, and the backing of the plant room, learns from the lenses um, of some of the lighthouses around um, Canada. Um, and under construction, um, uh, now completed, almost um, to be occupied next year, you see that clarity um, of the glazing as it rises up over the top of the building and also um, similar glazing to the podium. Now that podium, uh, pavilion doesn't touch the buildings and slides between it and essentially mediates between the plus 15 level to the plaza of some 30,000 square feet. And as we rise up the tower, the, the gracious um, corner curves of the building become evident. Now, the pavilion itself um, 
uh, became a scaffold for various activities and we worked with Brookfield to figure out where on this project would you build comfortable having a two-person coffee to an eight-person gala, gala dinner. Uh, and all of those events have been um, choreographed around um, this project. The filtered light that you saw in the previous images is something that we've replicated through the design of the pavilion roof. And this pavilion not only enables the functional connection between ground level, it also invites connection down to ground level, which is essentially the new upstairs. It's the point of destination given that the winter traffic through majority is, is on the plus 15 level. And viewed from the end, um, it then has a scale which is not dissimilar to the Palm Court in um, Brookfield Place in New York City in a similar height, as well as then enabling this social theatre of uh, promenade on the upper level overlooking the activity on the lower levels. So it essentially, as you see there in timber, then folds and shifts um, from the winter garden to the plaza component, um, creating an address point for uh, the 60-storey tower, uh, which has been phase one, um, just completed. The plaza also learns from the landscape and is a great connection between the architectural design um, and uh, the artists that we collaborated with. Uh, and the Office for Collaborative Research has an installation um, in the Rockies that measures and records and delivers live um, sound of the shifting uh, crevices um, uh, of the Bow River glacial formations, um, which are very much evident um, through the plaza, as well as combining them from seven different locations uh, for traffic and people activity around Calgary to create a really unique uh, site responsive um, installation. Inside the building, um, Macau Lexia has developed um, uh, uh, similar um, artworks that play uh, across the light of the building, not in a dissimilar way to the elements of the tower, and has wo woven his own narrative through a tapestry uh, of great scale that um, gives the building um, a fantastic sense of connection between these artworks um, and the architectural genesis. Um, to be one that are essentially buildings which are quiet additions to the context of London. So how do you build in the medieval and suburban context? Um, and how do you deal with those collisions um, of that often partisan approach um, between those who um, essentially prefer the status quo against those who champion um, the new? And essentially, uh, for me, it comes down to how our buildings uh, respect uh, the neighbours, how they shift um, to be informed by historical patterns and how they create great animated ground planes. Thank you. Thank you.